For one of our very first videos on the channel, we covered the horrific human experiments conducted at Unit 731. But in today's video, we will be looking at testimonials of those who were actually there. There are no known survivors to the twisted experiments, though there are the stories of those who worked at the unit, inflicting some of the most disturbing fates imaginable. It is perhaps helpful to first give a brief explanation as to what Unit 731 actually was. Unit 731 acted as the Imperial Japanese Army's testing and development site for all manner of biological weapons. It was founded by Shiro Ishii, a Surgeon General in the Japanese Army. He lobbied his superiors for his own research centre, eager to leverage such weapons. Shiro Ishii was a specialist microbiologist and served the Imperial Japanese Army from 1921 up until 1945. There is no doubt that he was a gifted individual who developed an incredibly effective water purification filter. However, his true interest was the creation of biological weapons for the Japanese Imperial Army. And at the Unit 731 facility, Ishii and his doctors engaged in some of the worst crimes against humanity to further his research. Unit 731 remains in infamy due to the inhumane treatment of test subjects, Chinese, Russian, Korean, British, American and Mongolian prisoners were all used. A wide array of victims was gathered up, men, women, children, pregnant women, the old and the infirm. Anthrax, bubonic plague, smallpox and many others were cultivated and their effects tested on the unwilling prisoners. Much of the records of the site were destroyed when the Japanese fled and so too were the last remaining prisoners as to ensure their silence. As for those who worked at 731 and the various subcamps, Shiro Ishii had them swear to silence for the rest of their lives, and to take with them what they did and saw to their graves. Thankfully, some of those who worked at Unit 731 spoke about what they witnessed or inflicted. Some were young, fresh out of school, or even actual schoolchildren, caught up in a war and situation they did not fully understand. Others engaged wholeheartedly in what they had done. Some of those who have spoken up about what they saw or did have remained anonymous. The first of the testimonies we will cover will be that of three young boys who went to Unit 731 as part of their youth corps. They joined the Manchuria and Mongolia Development Volunteer Corps that led them into going over to mainland China and to work at 731, aged only 15. One of the first things they noticed when arriving at the camps was that every Monday and Friday, smoke would constantly be pouring out of the chimneys. When one of these boys asked an officer what this was, he was told they were burning again. When they asked what they were burning, he was simply told logs. This may seem innocent enough, but logs was actually a euphemism for the prisoners of Unit 731. A common refrain would be, how many logs have you chopped today? How many logs have you burned today? The young boy questioned further, as he couldn't see any trees. It was then when the officer leveled with the boy and explained that the people were bad, and in his childhood innocence, he accepted the answer. One of the key events the boys discuss in the literature is the abandonment and destruction of Unit 731. They recall the many discussions about cyanide, and how it was distributed in case the workers of 731 were captured by the incoming Soviet forces. Before the staff of 731 fled, they set about destroying the evidence and burning the corpses of their victims. The young boys recalled drilling holes into the cell walls so that explosives could be placed. They recall moving the bodies from the cells, seeing the blood-stained bedding, and carrying the corpses to be burned. They recall putting gasoline over the bodies, how they gathered up the bones that were left and disposed of them in a dump. The boys, along with other members of Unit 731, fled on board a train heading towards Korea. Since the 1950s, the three ignored Ishii's prohibition on speaking about their time at Unit 731. They attended memorials and in 1955, they erected a cenotaph in Manchuria for the victims of the unit. Not everyone at Unit 731 was a doctor carrying out vivisections or infecting prisoners with disease. Some, like Ishibashi Naokata, were civilian workers who carried out work that was integral to testing. Aged only 18, Naokata joined the unit in 1938 and was responsible for examining the prisoners when they arrived. They would take blood and stool samples with all manner of physical data. 
This would then be the baseline to be compared with once the prisoner had been exposed to various pathogens. Without such otherwise normal acts being done, the grotesque experiments could not have been possible. Another testimony comes from Shino Hara, who was sent to Unit 731 in December of 1944. When he arrived, he was given an extensive education on human anatomy, army hygiene, and water supply. During this time, he was regaled with stories from his instructors about the sorts of experiments they conducted on Chinese civilians. He remembers being told how one group of instructors went to a city, sat down in a children's park, and started eating buns. When the local children gathered, they were given buns infected with some form of bacteria. They returned a few days later to see the effects and just how the disease spread amongst the population. During his time at the unit, Shino Hara witnessed trucks arriving nearly every day with prisoners. When he asked what their fate would be, he was told they would just be sent to the prisons and would be exposed to diseases such as the plague, cholera, typhus, and syphilis. He was explicitly told that he did not have the authorization to enter that part of the unit. This would change, however, when he was tasked with the demolition of the prison during the evacuation. On the 9th of August, 1945, he was told to destroy all evidence. He was part of the team clearing out the prisons of the dead victims of the experiments, stacking them in piles and burning them. He recalls entering one cell and seeing a message written in blood on the wall. It said, down with Japanese imperialism, long live President Chiang. The writing was fresh, meaning the prisoner was likely tossed into the fire alive. He recalls that once the bodies were dealt with, he was tasked with loading the medical equipment and medical samples onto a truck. They were dumped into a river whilst papers and documents were sent back to Japan. Another testimony comes from an anonymous army major and pharmacist, who, after the war, went on to become the head of a medical research lab. He recalls working with Unit 731 staff in the Hila region. Around 100 prisoners were brought along, with two or three stuffed at a time into a pillbox. They were strapped with all manner of monitors and then exposed to phosgene gas. If a prisoner managed to survive, they would be exposed to the gas again. Once dead, they would be dissected in a tent nearby to see the effects of the gas. The Major recalls one particular prisoner, a 68-year-old Chinese man who managed to survive the gas not once, but twice. It was then that he was told that this man had previously survived an injection of the plague at Unit 731. The staff then sought to finally put an end to the man, injecting him with air multiple times. Remarkably, he again survived, but in the end, they hanged him from a tree. The Major recalls the shock of the doctors who, when they dissected him, noted he had remarkably healthy organs akin to that of a much younger person. Another experiment he recalls attending was with five white Russian women. The test was to look at the effects of frostbite. There was a freezing apparatus in which the women's hands were forced. The temperature was set to negative 10 degrees Celsius that was reduced to negative 70. He recalls one woman's flesh falling away from her hand, revealing the bone. And in a truly disturbing example of inhumane treatment, one of the women went on to give birth in the prison. The baby, too, was exposed to frostbite in the same way. The next testimony comes from an army doctor named Yuasa Ken. He was given a number of speeches where he openly discussed not only his own crimes, but the wider role and goals of the Imperial Japanese Army in China. Whilst he was not a doctor working for Unit 731, his actions were aligned with their goals and typified the Imperial Japanese Army's approach. He states that it was to obtain much-needed natural resources, notably iron and coal, but also to extract medical research from the Chinese people through vivisection. He talks about the way that the Chinese were deemed racially inferior, and how from his early childhood he was taught to despise the Chinese and Korean people. By 1941, Ken had qualified as a doctor specializing in infectious disease. His goal was to become a village doctor, offering aid to a place that previously had no doctor. But instead, he became an army doctor, sent to China and saw firsthand how resources were stolen by the Japanese army. During his time in the army, Ken recalls operating on Chinese prisoners in order to improve his own surgical skills. 
In one instance, he recalls how a nurse was able to calm two Chinese prisoners who were being prepared for vivisection, something she had done countless times. Ken recalls performing all manner of unnecessary surgeries on one of the men. Once they were done performing a number of surgeries on him, they removed his right arm. Samples of this man's brain were taken and sent to a Japanese pharmaceutical company. After two hours, the man had died and was taken to a burial site for such victims. It was, however, already full of the victims of the doctors and a new ditch had to be dug. After this killing, Ken recalls that it got much easier to carry out such murders, noting that he had dissected 14 Chinese prisoners during his time with the army. Whilst never being part of Unit 731, he did supply the unit with bacteria samples to be used in their own experiments. When Ken was first captured by the Chinese, he did not at first appreciate the fact that he had committed horrendous crimes. He broke down exactly what he did, confessing to his crimes, and was sentenced to 11 years in prison. Following his release in 1956, Ken became an outspoken critic of Japan's response to its many war crimes both on a personal and societal level. He comments how people who had committed similar acts simply moved out, either unaware or unwilling to face their crimes. As none of the prisoners survived Unit 731, and as much of the evidence was destroyed, we have to rely on the accounts of those who worked at the dreaded facility. Some did keep their silence, as instructed by Shiro Ishii, but thankfully, some spoke out.